Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the distinguished lecture of uh, James, or Mr. James McConnell, um, the Associate Administrator for Safety Infrastructure and Operations for the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, my name is Joseph Kent. I'm the Director of Education for the National Atomic Test Museum. We're excited to have you all here with us this evening. And we do have a special guest this evening to introduce uh, Mr. McConnell. Um, John Longnecker, who is our uh, chair of the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation, um, our board of trustees. And he is gonna be here to introduce uh, Mr. McConnell this evening for uh, his distinguished lecture. Now, uh, John, as I mentioned, is the chair of the Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation. And he's also the president of Longnecker and Associates and has more than 35 years of experience in energy and national defense. And so we are excited to have him here. And just wanna let everybody know too that um, after Mr. McConnell's presentation, we're gonna be um, taking some questions for, for Mr. McConnell. So please uh, put any questions you have either in the chat box or the Q and A, and we'll be more than happy to, to fill those questions uh, to him at the end. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, here to uh, for the distinguished lecture of Mr. James McConnell, the Associate Administrator for Safety, Infrastructure, and Operations for the NNSA. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Mr. John Longenecker. Joe, thank you and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's distinguished lecturer, Jim McConnell. Uh, Jim, in his role as uh, Associate, associate Administrator is responsible for some of the key elements of NNSA, safety activities, operations, infrastructure, capital planning, packaging and transportation, uh, nuclear materials integration, and sustainment and environmental programs for the uh, US national security enterprise. Jim also played a key role in addressing the issues surrounding COVID-19 and helping to assure that the workforce remains safe while we made maximum progress on the key national security milestones over the past couple of years. In my role as part of the Energy Facility Contractors Group, I get to, to work with Jim on a regular basis. And I can tell you that there is no better partner to have when you're faced with a problem as uh, complex and ever changing as COVID. Given the critical mission of NNSS here in Nevada, Jim plays a really key role in assuring that the test site will remain a reliable, safe place for NNSA to perform some of its most critical work for the decades ahead. And I know he'll talk about that tonight. Prior to joining NNSA, Jim held several senior positions at the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. And there he got to know the safety issues surrounding the NNSA sites very well. Jim also had a distinguished career in the nuclear Navy, serving as a US Navy submarine officer. Jim, thank you for your service to our country. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my pleasure. I'm I'm glad to be here, and I am thankful for the invitation. I uh, have a, a presentation here, and then, like I said, we'll be happy to take some questions at the end. Let me start right now by sharing my screen. I want to make sure that this works. Can you see that? John, are you able to Looks see my perfect. screen? Okay, good, good, good. All right, so good, good evening, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm Jim McConnell. I'm the Associate Administrator for Safety, Infrastructure, and Operations here at NNSA. Uh, and in that role, I have uh, the, the, the lead role for safety policy uh, within NNSA and also uh, responsible for the mission enabling program of infrastructure and some key operations. Uh, which I will focus on here tonight. So NNSA's infrastructure is extensive, complex, and in many critical areas, more than half a century old. We have about 50,000 employees, counting our MO partners. We maintain about 37 million square feet of active facility space, and we consume about the amount of energy it takes to power 230 or 231,000 homes for a year. 
We manage a land mass the size of Delaware. Uh, no surprise to everybody here. The Nevada National Security Site by itself is about the size of Rhode Island. And when we add the other locations where NSA has its operations, we become the size of the second uh, smallest state. Uh, along with that, we, we include responsibility for about 2,000 miles of roads and the telecommunications, the sewer, and the other support infrastructure that goes along with essentially operating a small state. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's true that about half of all of our facilities are in what we consider poor condition. And about 60% of them are beyond their expected service life. Uh, so, so that means that many of NNSA's nuclear security enterprise production, utility, and support systems are, are old and require quite a bit of attention and maintenance to be allow us to continue to uh, serve their important function. That's, that's primarily the day job of the people that work in my organization. Altogether, NSA has a total replacement plant value of about $116 billion worth of, of total assets. And we have a deferred maintenance on those facilities so almost $6 billion worth of, of maintenance. So, so that's the kind of challenge we have, uh, but we have a great uh, set of employees and we really have the focus that it's required to ensure that even in that older facilities, uh, NNSA maintains a safe, reliable and resilient infrastructure. But our investment in maintaining it has not historically kept pace with the mission requirements. Uh, and I want to stop here real quick. Is that while all that is true, and we have some old facilities, I like to describe uh, uh, something. Um, my my brother has a 1946 Willys pickup truck uh, that he just loves, and he babies that thing, and he takes great care of it, and it is in really good shape. Uh, I contrast that to the 2013 Hyundai Sonata that I sent with my son to college, uh, much, much newer for, uh, car, but uh, unfortunately he doesn't take care of it quite as lovingly as my brother takes care of his truck. So the fact that it's old doesn't, doesn't mean my brother's truck is in bad shape. And the fact that my son's car is new doesn't mean it's in good shape. It's just a matter of how much effort it takes to maintain those things. So you can see from our uh, you know, the pie charts here on this, that, that we have some old facilities and they require quite a lot of care. Um, it, within those facilities, we find ourselves tackling five weapon, weapon program modernization programs all at the same time, while we're also trying to increase pit production and along with, with establishing a 30 pit per year capability at Los Alamos and, and a, a 50 year uh, capability at Savannah River for at least 80 pits a year eventually uh, as an enterprise. There's a lot of, of other things we have to do. We have to maintain the aging infrastructure. We have to transform safety management and we have to address both waste and nuclear materials. And I'll get into more detail on all of those things. So let me start with modernizing infrastructure. Uh, we are grateful for the new authorities that we were recently provided from Congress uh, that has allowed NNSA's infrastructure modernization efforts to really take off in the last five years. And we're putting those new requirements to, to work. Our budget in fiscal year 21 was about two and a half billion dollars, which is an 82% increase from where we were just in fiscal 2015 when my office was stood up. So that's pretty good indication that, that the administration, several administrations and several Congresses have understood the importance of our enterprise and the importance of investing in it. Um, we are more quickly addressing risks now that Congress has given us a $20 million threshold for what we call minor construction. So most of our major facility construction falls into one of these two categories major construction, something like the, the projects that are going on right now at U1A. Um, you can see a picture of it in the lower right-hand corner, but also a myriad of smaller but 
just as vital facilities. And so you can see examples of them in many of the other pictures here. So those, the ability to, to manage an efficient and effective portfolio of small projects is really enhanced now that we were able to double that threshold from a previous $10 million to $20 million a year. And we've put that to, to pretty good use, we think. In the, in the five years since we started my office, uh, we've completed hundreds of these recapitalization projects. And right now we have hundreds more currently underway. 70 of those projects are between that 10 and $20 million threshold where we can really start to, to build bigger facilities, tackle bigger problems, address our issues uh, more head on. At the same time, we've increased our annual maintenance investment by more than 40%. So that's the investment in the existing facilities and structures and systems uh, that we aren't yet ready to replace or don't need to replace. Uh, but that's an important part of also addressing our aging infrastructure. Along with building new facilities, we have a, a large legacy of old facilities, some dating all the way back to the Manhattan Project no, and the early Cold, Cold War, no surprise to, to the folks uh, in and around the Nevada National Security Site previous test site. And we've been successful in eliminating about 7.6 million square feet of excess facilities. And we do these for several different reasons. The first is uh, some of them actually pose a safety risk to our, our workers and the environment uh, if, if we aren't uh, very careful in, in, in remediating things. So getting rid of excess facilities reduces our risk. Uh, while those facilities exist, we still have to put some maintenance into them. We have to maintain fire protection and, and environmental controls. So there's a, there's a cost to keeping our excess facilities. Uh, and, and also these facilities tend to be in some of the most useful locations. The oldest facilities were put in the best spaces. And so with the ability to get rid of them frees up space for us to build new facilities for the enterprise of the future. So those are some of the, the, the projects and some of the, the physical results. The, the systems that we've put in place are what I really wanna spend a little bit of time talking about because that's where some of our most um, significant changes have come about that will allow us to be prepared for the future. So we in, in my organization, Safety Infrastructure and Operations, have developed what we like to call a science-based infrastructure stewardship process, uh, obviously stealing off of the science-based stockpile stewardship. Now we don't use supercomputers and, and our systems aren't underpinned by, uh, you know, very elaborate physics models that, that goes into stockpile stewardship. But we do use uh, very innovative and cutting edge for most of the infrastructure community systems to allow us to understand the condition of our facilities to figure out which tasks and which projects we should prioritize to minimize risk, maintain the ability to support the enterprise, and, and also the ability then to maximize the dollars we get and the time and the people we have to do the most benefit possible for our mission. So I'd like to go through just a few of those real quick. The first is, is what we call uh, our stewardship tool such as Builder and the Mission Dependency Index. So Builder is, a, is a, pro, a, a process we took from the US Army Corps of Engineers, but we've done quite a bit of work to expand on it that allows us to go down to the system component and even subcomponent level and do a, a, a thorough analysis to understand what remaining life of a, of a system or component is so that we can identify which components or subsystems might be ready to fail and therefore put an entire facility at risk if, for example, you know, we lose the, the ventilation system or the fire suppression system uh, because of some material failure, then we wouldn't be able to operate the facility. So that gives us a, a, an understanding of what the, the consequence 
or excuse me, what the likelihood of, of, a, of a failure is. The next thing I want to talk about was is the mission dependency index, which we've gone through and we've looked at every single one of our 6,000 or so facilities, and we've given them a score between one and 100, which calculates what the, the consequence of losing that facility is. Will we be able to continue our mission? Will we have a short time impact? Will we potentially have a long time impact? So if you take builder, which is the, the likelihood of something failing, mission dependency index, which is the consequence, in my world, you know, likelihood times consequence is risk. And so we have an a objective analytical basis for figuring out what the risk of each one of our 6,000 facilities are. And so you can see an example here in some of our, our on the left-hand side of this, which is some of our the dashboards and the data that we provide to our senior leaders, we can lay out by site, we can drill down to within a site by, uh, by asset to tell what the, the risk is of those various facilities and what the portfolio looks like. Whether it's a discussion here of, of you know, what, what the composition of facilities are, or we can take that same data and plot it against the age of our facilities. And so you can see that, that most facilities built for industrial uses have a design life somewhere in the 40 to 50 year period. Things that are younger than that tend to be in good shape. Unfortunately, we have quite a few things that are large and beyond that uh, normal 40 to 50 year timeline, which is the investments we need to put into recapitalizing our facilities. So we've also then taken some actions, as you can see here, I'll talk a few, to, to make sure that the dollars we do get and the time and the resources are put to the greatest use. How do we get the most bang for our buck? And I'm only gonna talk about a few of them here, but the first I wanna talk with about is the streamlined production, execution, acquisition, and recapitalization effort, or as we call it, SPEAR. Uh, just recently, we put a board together, the SPEAR board, to provide oversight to working groups that are tackling our execution challenges from different angles. Led by my team, the board includes representatives from all eight of the NNSA sites, including representatives from both our federal and our MO partner organizations. They help manage all the different sub tools that we have available to us, which I'll discuss here uh, very quickly. Um, we start with the, with the standard acquisition and recapitalization, which is an initiative to standardize designs. The, the big one-of-a-kind facilities that, that you're probably familiar with, U1A the, and Jasper, and of course, and other sites, the, the plutonium facility at Los Alamos or the uranium facilities at Y12 or the tritium facilities at Savannah River, those big one-of-a-kind high-risk facilities uh, get a lot of attention and uh, rightfully so, but they're managed by our Office of Defense Programs. My office builds a lot of standard industrial facilities. We build offices, we build light laboratories, we build emergency operations centers and fire stations and, and things like that that are not one-of-a-kind unique and they're not uh, outside the experience of commercial industry. So we're trying very hard to make sure that we can build our facilities essentially in the same uh, quality standards and using the same techniques that the best in class private entities can do. Uh, the private sector can build very good, high quality, reliable facilities and still most of the time end up paying less than the government pays. So we're trying to close that gap with something we call the Enhanced Minor Construction and Commercial Practices or the EMC squared pilots. You can see one here on the left, it's the Emergency Operations Center that we're currently building at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, we use commercial standards, we use uh, commercial practices. We, we try and cut through the, the, the fog that sometimes can surround the very extensive list of requirements that come with, with contracting and working in the, in the government and certainly working at the National Nuclear Security Administration. 
So those, those requirements that are fully appropriate if we're gonna build a high hazard facility uh, can just be barriers to entry for, for new contractors or can be time and expense in a, in a project that reduces the total number of facilities we can build within a given budget. So we're pretty proud of our EMC squared pilots, uh, but an even faster way to get commercial property is to just out and out buy it. Uh, we in NSA up until very recently have never really used that. But starting just last year, we had a need for a facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and it just happened that there was a commercial facility up for sale. And for the first time in my 30 years of experience, uh, we have actually just decided that the, the best thing to do for the government is to buy a facility that already exists. And we're not quite through with that yet. There's due diligence, uh, but you know, hopefully in the next two or three weeks, we will actually have purchased a facility which is, is the fastest and it turns out, you know, on a per square foot basis, probably the cheapest way to get general purpose uh, capabilities. So those are just a couple of examples of, of the things in our streamlining processes that we're most proud of in terms of, the, of our ability to deliver a portfolio of initiatives to, to meet needs all across our mission programs uh, all at the same time. Now. Now, you heard my title was safety infrastructure and operations. I actually started my career and most of my career has been in the safety side of things. So this is near and dear to me. Uh, my office is responsible for some of the higher level uh, safety policies and interpretations and making sure that NNSA as a whole has a strong, robust safety culture uh, we follow our standards and implement integrated safety management. We work hand in glove with the field offices and our MO partners. The, the, probably the most important federal person for safety at the Nevada National Security Site is Dave Bowman, the field office manager in Nevada. Same is true for all of our other sites. Our field office managers serve a really vital role, uh, but, but I have a cadre of safety professionals that augment theirs and provide additional focus and function and also some tools that we can deliver at an enterprise level that really wouldn't be possible at an individual site. So let me just talk about a few of them. Uh, one of the things that, that's really important for uh, NNSA and for, for any regulatory agency and since we're self-regulatory, uh, is to have a good objective measure of overall safety performance. And there are so many disciplines that we're involved in that that can be very hard to do. So we've taken quite a bit of effort to put together what we just call the, the safety performance checkerboard. And the reason we call it a checkerboard is that there are, depending on how you count them, 13 or 14 or maybe even 15 unique sub-disciplines of safety, you know, that how well you're doing in fire protection doesn't necessarily have any impact on how well you're doing in radiation protection, which might not have any impact on how well you're doing in uh, electrical safety. So, so we, we manage all those safety management programs in an integrated fashion. And then we look across all the sites, Nevada and all the other NSA sites to get a, a perspective of how the enterprise as a whole is doing and also to be able to figure out where in our enterprise we're performing the best so that if we find a place to it, there's, there's a deficiency or where we need to improve performance, it, it's not simply a wagging the finger at somebody and saying, you, know, you need to get better in this discipline. Our job is then to help, not, not direct, you know, not take responsibility for m and partners, but to help them point them in the direction of, Hey, go ask, you know, if, if Lawrence Livermore does something a little better than Sandia, our job is to know that and point them in the right direction. Uh, so that's what both our checkerboard and our dashboard do. The thing I'm most in, uh, excited about in the safety environment right now is SAFER. And, and SAFER is our 
safety analytics forecasting and evaluation reporting. So I talked about how in the infrastructure side of our house, we've done quite a bit to try and get uh, objective data and risk-informed decision-making that comes from analytics that we derive from all of our, our sites. But we're trying now to do the same thing with an innovative software platform uh, for, for our safety environment, where we can take the enormous amounts of information that are generated by our MNO partners at all the eight sites we operate and a few other uh, ancillary things like our Office of Secure, of Secure Transportation. If we can bring all that information together, synthesize it and make it useful for everyone so that we have a single source of truth and we have a, a good repository of knowledge and information where we can continue to accumulate this information and not just have it pass through the system, uh, we'll be able to have a, a much more robust uh, fundamental objective analysis on which to decide how well we're performing, where we're having safety issues, where we're, where we're having safety strengths. Uh, as, as opposed to when I first started at the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, we would go out and do a review. We'd bring subject matter experts out. They'd look at something. They'd write a report, hand the report over to the department. The department would look at it, take some actions to resolve the issues. If we're lucky, they would remember that report for a year. But eventually that report would would end up on a shelf somewhere and whatever insights were in that report would be lost. Uh, just, you know, that's just human nature. But with our, with our new analytics capability, we can digest that information into a system where it's searchable and it's combined with other indicators so that that, that history and that knowledge isn't lost. It's, it's retained and it grows over time to become the way to communicate what the, what the safety experts of the past learned and pass it on to the safety experts of the future. So we're really excited about that as a, uh, a fundamental enabler for our enterprise as we continue to grow. All of this is in our NNSA safety roadmap. Uh, you know, we first put it out in 2018 and we just recently, earlier this year, put out our first uh, update of it so that it's all refreshed. It includes having succeeded in certain objectives such as uh, getting all of NNSA's training and qualification programs accredited, just like you know, university or, a, or an educational institution would be accredited. Uh, we in NNSA are the first organization within the entire Department of Energy to have our entire uh, undersecretariat process, which involves 15 or 16 different sub-organizations, all get accredited. So it's quite an achievement that we're pretty proud of. Having those qualified safety representatives, having giving them the tools they need to understand the environment, to be more effective in doing their oversight, uh, that's the backbone of our, of our knowledge base and our objective approach to integrated safety management. So pretty excited about our our path forward in, in this regard. I wanna talk about a few other things that, that are the responsibility of, of my organization and probably are uh, of interest to this group. Uh, first is, is radioactive waste management. It is, it is true that, that waste management is a site responsibility on a site-by-site -site basis, uh, but our enterprise is integrated, right? What happens at one site uh, can affect what goes on at another site. Uh, we have, for example, uh, you know, quite a, a challenge to make sure that we can continuously manage the transuranic waste, which is the waste generated primarily from working with, with plutonium and, and, and obviously any other transuranic element. But the, the waste that's generated from our pit production will, will increase over time and the ability to handle and manage that safely and to uh, appropriately characterize, package, ship, and dispose of that waste at the waste isolation pilot plant will be a, 
an essential enabling element of our overall pit production efforts and, and other, any other activity that involves uh, plutonium and transuranics. Uh, one of the things that I continuously uh, harp on to, to my people and to others is that uh, a single bad true waste drum probably has more effect on our mission than a single bad pit. If we accidentally make a pit that we can't qualify uh, for, for weapons reserve, then you know, unfortunately we just have to take that pit, put it back in the process you know, uh, and, and return it to melt it down and, and to make a new pit. But if we have a bad waste drum in it and it gets to whip, well, we've all seen what happens. You all have seen what happened with a bad, with a, a, a bad systems uh, a management process. It could have an effect with low level waste, for example, that recently happened when we uh, you know, had a, uh, an upset that resulted in, in ship, a shipment from Y12 to Nevada that, that wasn't compliant. So all the, the system approaches and the, the enterprise considerations of safe waste management, both in terms of it being a mission enabler, but also in terms of it being an opportunity to ensure we can, we can hit the requirements and have the quality for our waste management operations that is so critical to our continuing enterprise and our continuing operations, that gets a lot of our focus. As a matter of fact, my, my organization, NA50, has a commitment this year to conduct at least two more uh, enterprise-wide uh, waste management studies to make sure that we can optimize the efficiency and importantly, the safety of our waste management activities. Uh, so the last sub-element I wanted to talk about uh, is, is nuclear materials management and safeguard. It's another fairly uh, niche activity that is the responsibility of my organization. We actually do it on behalf of the entire United States government, not just NNSA or even just the Department of Energy. Uh, but we are responsible for the Nuclear Materials Management and Safeguard System, or NIMIS as we call it, which is the government's system of record to account for and control nuclear materials, including things like peaceful use obligations. So we track both ours and the NRC's uh, use of nuclear materials, transactions, movements, and inventories within the United States and between the United States and our foreign partners and uh, foreign customers. That results in about a million lines of inventory uh, from a individual tracking annually that we, you know, account for it in a very detailed uh, way to, to be able to assure uh, our government and foreign governments that we have knowledge of, of where all of our materials are. Some of these materials were were transferred in the 40s, and we still maintain active records on them. Uh, the other thing is it involves understanding some of the specifics and the background of that information. Turns out that some of our most important uh, areas to, to maintain involve the Nevada National Security Site uh, as, a, as a potential uh, location for some of our more key, um, but 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 somewhat uh, sensitive uh, activities with with managing the, the Nimis system. So I wanted to make sure I highlighted those, and and sort of end here with a with a bit of a conclusion that that sums up the three main focuses of my organization. Uh, we must ensure that NNSA's infrastructure meets the highest safety standards. Uh, we cannot operate unless we are safe, right? If we, if we are, if we are um, not able to ensure that we can protect the workers, the public, and the environment, then we will not be given the uh, the trust and the flexibility and the uh, resources and, and authority to continue to operate, which is, which is of 
crucially important to our success. So safety comes first in, in everything we do. Uh, but because we have a relatively old enterprise and a complicated enterprise, we do face quite a few challenges. Those challenges show up primarily in my, for me as aging infrastructure, uh, you know, trying to keep a 60-year-old bus rolling and changing the tires while it's moving is part of our challenge. But I'm proud of the people that we, we have on our team from our MO partners uh, at, at all of our sites, our, our federal employees at all the sites, and all the folks at headquarters who continue to pull on that important uh, task. The last thing is, uh, and our, our mission, as you all probably know, is expanding fairly dramatically over the course of this decade. Uh, we are thankful that we have increasing resources in order to challenge to take on those challenges, but you know, we're we're never going to be able to just buy our way out of the the work we have to do if we can't find innovative solutions to improve our effectiveness, to improve our efficiency, uh, to do the mission better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, and and I'm not, I don't want that to sound trivial. Um, we're, we're not gonna do it faster if we can't do it better, uh, but we have to be both safer, more secure, and more nimble all at the same time. That's, that's our fundamental challenge. I think we're up to it. I think we have some proof in the last few years of, of clear achievements that demonstrate we can be innovative and solve these problems. And so I'm excited to continue to do it. Uh, and I'm just happy to, to have the, the position I have and to be part of the team that I am working with in order to deliver these key mission enablers to our national security, be they the safe, secure, and reliable stockpile, or uh, non and counter proliferation and other science uh, developments that are all part of what NNSA and the department does at the Nevada National Security Site. So with that, I will thank you all for listening to me today. And I believe I'm now I'll turn it over to John or someone and be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Mr. McConnell, for your presentation and for sharing how your department carries out its, its critical mission uh, in order to focus on safety and the infrastructure of these various sites. Really appreciate you being here and presenting that and, and sharing that with us this evening. Um, one question I have is you talked a lot about the, the innovative um, work that you're doing and the innovative solutions to those challenges that you face. Are there anything, are there any um, new innovations coming in the pipeline that will, that are, you're looking forward to or areas that you think um, might be, you know, made easier with new advent of or tech, new technologies, I should say. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, not, they don't come for free though. They're, everything has, has challenged. So I'll give you an, an example. Uh, NNSA spends on the order of $600 million a year in maintenance. We have lots and lots of facilities with lots and lots of complex systems in them. Uh, and, and just like everyone in, 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 a, in industries, we would much rather do preventive and scheduled maintenance than do unscheduled corrective maintenance. So the ability to have good knowledge of the condition of our facilities, like anyone else with, with a large industrial complex is, is very important. Well, in the commercial world, a lot of people have gone to uh, smart machines that have internal monitoring and have Bluetooth 
connections, then you can determine whether or not a, a bearing is failing or if, a, if you know, something is overheating uh, through, through modern technology. Well, we operate in a secure environment. So having our machines radiate information isn't always the best idea. So we have to figure out how to take those kinds of technologies, which might seem uh, you know, pretty easy to do in, in, in commercial manufacturing, but, but, but customize them to our approach. So, so we, we look at all those things, but we have, to, we have to then have to take that technology and put another layer of, of security on it uh, and, and other kinds of act things like that. But those are, the, those are some of the ways that technology can help us. On the one hand, you know, we have a lot of old things, but they tend to be, uh, you know, if we replace a, an, an HVAC system that's 30 years old with a new one, the new ones tend to be smaller, more reliable, more, more environmentally friendly. And so you know, they, they, they don't pay for themselves, but there is a, you know, there's an operating benefit to not, not spending as much money on just the electricity to run uh, a variable speed uh, fan rather than having an old single speed fan with a bunch of pneumatic dampers. So that's, you know, we, that those are the kinds of things we we take care of, advantage of as much as we possibly can. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that and your answer. Um, and then on the flip side, you were talking a little bit about the challenges you face, you know, currently with the stockpile and, and other challenges um, within the department and at and NSA at large. Now, the one question I have are there are any challenges that you foresee coming down in the future as well? So when we're talking about the technologies and, and what can help you face those challenges, what kind of challenges do you anticipate um, later down the road is something you might think, um, you know, would come up and, and need to be addressed? Great, great question. So, so the, the, the challenges that, that we're going to face, um, first off is, it, we are we are going through a, a demographics shift just like most of the government um, being accelerated. Uh, we have oh I'm, I'm gonna it's not I'm gonna guess we have probably between 30 and 40 percent of our employees who are are retirement eligible and and so we are now in the process of hiring up because we need more people, but also bringing on a whole bunch of, of early career folks, people who, who come to our enterprise with, with different skills, thankfully the skills we need, different expectations, um, and, and the ability to bring the the you know, the, the kinds of, of more uh, connected systems, more connected individuals uh, that, that will allow us to, to, to be more flexible and be more effective in the future. We were born out of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was all about stovepipes, right? The people at Los Alamos were not allowed to know, for the most part, what was going on at Hanford or what was going on at Oak Ridge. That's in our DNA, uh, and and it's hard to get that out. We are not in that world anymore. We need to be connected. We need to have people who who understand and who are are much better at that. The communication, some of the the skills. I mean, we're going to need physicists. We're going to need computer scientists. That sort of goes without saying. Uh, we need machinists. We, we need uh, you know, pipe fitters. We need all of these skills. Uh, they, were, they were honest to goodness. I, when I, earlier in my career, there was, there was an operator at, at one of the facilities at Y12 who operated by sense of smell. He had done that for so long, he knew 
Okay, when sort of like roasting coffee beans, right? He, he knew when it was time to move on to the next thing. Well, that's gone. We're going to have we're going to have skills for people who who have to be able to to do process analysis, who have to be uh, you know plugged into to figure out how to adapt new technologies to old systems, and that's a that that's a big challenge. And so I look forward to it, but it's it's no small feat. Absolutely not, but I know the department and you specifically are up to the challenge. So we look forward to seeing the next the next steps of that. So um, I appreciate that. We do have some audience questions as well. Um, now, the first one is, as you remove old facilities, um, is consideration given a possible unique historical value to preserve the facility or part of it to tell the story of how you got to where you are today? Oh, oh ab absolutely. So. For one thing, just in the last four years, maybe five years, um, there was legislation that was passed and we created what's called the, the Manhattan Project National Park, which actually right now has primarily three you know, facilities at Hanford, facilities at at Los Alamos and civil facilities at Oak Ridge, which were three of the main, you know, original Manhattan Project locations. And so several facilities at each of those sites has been designated now to be actually a part of the park. Some of them have already been preserved so that people can go and I think B reactor up at Hanford if you wanted to, if you're the kind of person who wants to go on vacation and see an old uh, Manhattan Project facility, you can actually go there. We're trying to figure out how to do that at Los Alamos and NY12. It's a little bit harder to bring people into a park in the middle of an operating national security facility, but, uh, but we're working on that. But, but, he, but on, you know, there's lots of historical, uh, really cool stuff as any of you have had an opportunity to actually go through the, the, the old test site, the Nevada National Security site. There's so many cool things there. So each site has a, uh, or each state has a state historical preservation office, SHPO as we call them. And so part of our process is every time we declare a facility access to our needs and access to any other government elements needs, we make sure that the state historical preservation office takes a look at our facilities for exactly for this reason to figure out if they have historical uh, relevance and, and in some cases, the right answer is, now that we don't need it for our mission, we need to preserve it for its historical value. And, in, and if that's not the case, then we move to the next step, which is often to, to, to knock them down. It, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's good to hear. It's nice to preserve our history and, and to make sure that you know, we don't forget uh, what uh, those in the past have done to propel us to where we are now. Now, one of the key missions of the National Atomic Testing Museum specifically is informing the young folks who visit that there are a range of great job opportunities in NNSA and particularly at the NNSS. Uh, can you discuss a bit about the types of skills that the NNSA is seeking out for the future? Yeah, I, I touched a little bit on that before, but let me let me be more specific about it. Um, when I when I said that we operate something about the size of Delaware, and so we have all of the needs to operate essentially what it is like to operate a state, but it's a state that has high security, uh, you know, high hazard, national security, science and engineering along with it. Uh, I don't want to say that Delaware doesn't have those things, but 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 think of the kinds of people that you need to do that. As I said, we need we need top of the line physicists and top of the line uh, computer scientists, and we need materials experts, and we need uh, you know biologists. I mean, that our our national laboratories ended up because of the work we did and the skills we have. You know, some of the early modeling of the, the coronavirus was actually done because we have the capability 
with our supercomputers and our scientists at our national laboratories to do that. They weren't hired to do that, but they had the skills and, and the, the nation and the world needed them. Uh, but that goes all the way down to, I shouldn't say down, it, we're probably, you know, a really good welder is incredibly hard to come by. And we weld some really, really intricate things. And, and we're probably as, I would probably ask some of our most senior folks at, at either NTES or, or our laboratories and, and, and said, okay, you know, what do you most need? I, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't say we need welders. So, so we need we need the whole gamut of things from from systems engineers of the future the people who can who can interconnect how do we how do we share our classified information over distances how do we um, how do we put the 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 scorpius and the the big machines that we're going to put into una we need we need the kinds of people who can install it maintain it operate it and then deal with the with the data that comes out of it. Plus, you got to build the test devices. So um, that's what I think is so exciting about about our future in NSA is is if you have an interest in in national security and you have a skill set, we probably need you somewhere in our enterprise. <laughs> No, that is exciting because I think especially um, for those that are coming up through schools, you know, maybe have an interest in a, you know, in, in a science or, or maybe, in, you know, want to do uh, work in more, you know, engineering and, and things like that or more of the trades, you know, they don't necessarily think of, of this as an opportunity, right? It's, it's normally they think of your standard places to work. But as you mentioned, with the sites, across the, the nuclear complex, there's so many opportunities for, for various jobs and, you know, across different skill levels, across different educational levels, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities out there and it's, and it's amazing. And, and again, a couple more. So, so our first ever uh, energy net zero facility in all of NSA is out at the Nevada National Security Site. It's a relatively new building that we built at Mercury. So we're we're putting up, uh, you know, photovoltaics. We're we're trying to figure out how to take our skill sets and our opportunities and and be at the forefront of of climate resilience, and uh, you know. I'm proud to say that, that this year, NNSA is going to install 40 new electric vehicle chargers. And we already have 111 electric vehicles in our fleet. Um, so, you know, we, we are, whatever your passion is, we, you know, we need people who are gonna help us figure out how to maintain our national security and also address climate change because we are just as serious about climate change as we are about not about maintaining a strategic deterrent. That's amazing. And you know that goes into what you were talking about earlier where especially the mission of your department where in your office that you know it's not just about this one area. That when you're talking about safety infrastructure, it, it, it runs the gamut of, of a lot of different, um, a lot of different areas of concern, whether it's, you know, the, you know, nuclear component of it, or the climate change component, or just, as we talked about earlier, with just even preserving, you know, those, those historic sites and making sure that those remain uh, for the future generations to, to be able to, to learn and visit. Um, and so that's pretty amazing. I, I love that. And um, I think we have one more question. Uh, with your extensive background in safety, what have we learned during the COVID crisis about use of advanced technologies and new ways of doing work in hazardous environments that you manage in the national security complex? So, so uh, another great question. You know, uh, the 
in, in, in safety, there's a couple of, of, of general themes. One is really good, strong safety is based on layers. Right? Don't depend on any one thing. So in nuclear safety, we have a defense in depth, you know, layers of protection. The same is true with, with COVID. Uh, you know, I'm so happy that that we have lots and lots of people vaccinated. Yeah, that, that is, a, is probably the most, um, I'm an electrical engineer, not an epidemiologist or a biologist, but it seems to me, you know, the, the most fundamental thing, right? That's the control at the center. But, but that doesn't mean you don't, you know, we've all learned to wash our hands more. Let's keep on washing our hands, right? If you don't need to be near people, it's just a wise idea to stay six feet apart, right? I, you know, my, my wife works in a hospital. She's been wearing a, a mask you know, it, for her job every day. I won't say how long, because for her whole professional career, right? And so, it, it, yeah, I, I understand a lot. Of, I don't want to get into the politics of this, but um, what we've learned is that that the more of those layers you put in place, the better off you are. Uh, that item number one. Item number two, while it's good to use personal actions, uh, they can be unreliable, right? It's, you, you take your mask off at a restaurant because you're eating and you just forget to put it back on. And right, it's, so, so what we've been doing is, uh, it's been detected that, that ultraviolet light has a disinfectant capability. And so we've been installing ultraviolet light uh, disinfection systems in our ventilation systems, it's certainly in all of our new facilities, trying to figure out how to backfit them into older facilities, that's harder to do. Um, but, you know, now we're smarter, right? So our, our new, the new those, those pictures I showed you in the, at the beginning of my brief, uh, Many of the new ones have UV ventilation disinfection systems. So, so those are the, you know, the kinds of things that, that, that we do to keep our workforce and anybody who interacts with us in our offices um, safe. Just st staying, teaching or, or reminding people who normally work with very hazardous materials how to be safe was really pretty easy, right? If you got somebody who works with plutonium, they're pretty used to, to being conscious of safety controls. Tell them that they've got another hazard out there. They, 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 they know how to deal with it, which is good. Yeah, it, it sounds like they already deal with the strict nature of things. It's just a lateral movement for them versus having to be a, a huge um, a huge thing no that, that's that's important I, and um, you know I, I noticed that you know across the board in, in a lot of these a lot of these facilities that or you know whether it's the um, the complex at various sites or you know hospitals where all safety is such a, a heavy focus that you know it's it's just another day it's just another another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, it's a it, it's a hazard, right? It and you know, with Omicron is that there'll, then there'll be something after Omicron, right? And as and as as long as we appreciate how to be how to protect ourselves and how to protect others, and we we understand the defense in depth and the application of controls will we'll weather this. Absolutely. Well, I believe that is, I'm gonna double check to make, see if we have any more questions. Um, I think that's it, but Mr. McConnell, it was an absolute honor and pleasure to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your night to speak with our, our, um, our supporters and uh, those in attendance this evening. 
And we really appreciate that. And it was just a fascinating look into the work that you do, um, you know, within, you know, safety infrastructure and operations out of NSA. So we just, again, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Have a great night, everyone. Jim, thanks so much. This is John. And we really look forward to seeing you here in Nevada again. We'll give you a tour of the museum. I really look forward to getting your thoughts on what's missing in our telling of the uh, NNSA story. So thanks again. Looking forward to it. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Take Thanks, care. Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to, to be here with us um, to listen to this really important presentation and really important look into what's going on today. That's one of the biggest questions we always get here at the museum is what's going on? You know, what, what is the, the, the present and future look like at these sites? So thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Mr. McConnell, you have a wonderful evening and thank you again. Good night.